21-year-old Elisa Lamb disappeared several weeks ago. The Canadian tourist had been staying at the Cecil Hotel. Hotel guests reported the water pressure in the building was low. A maintenance worker checked the water tanks on the roof and found the body. L.A. authorities say the body had been inside for at least two weeks and was severely decomposed. According to the LAPD, the tank's metal latch could be easily opened, but added that access to the hotel's roof is secured with an alarm and lock. Authorities released security of video last week showing Lamb acting strangely in the hotel. They characterized her disappearance as suspicious. This is True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Hello again. Today's episode, Dark Water. The body of 21-year-old Elisa Lamb, a Canadian visiting Los Angeles, was found in a water tank atop the Cecil Hotel in L.A. where she was staying. This was on February 19, 2013. Now, she disappeared from the hotel about three weeks previously on January 29th after checking into the hotel on the 26th of January. The circumstances of Elisa's death have been the topic of speculation and theories, ranging from the paranormal to unusual behavior stemming from her bipolar disorder and maybe her medications. The circumstances of her death have been compared to plot elements in a 2005 horror movie as well, and the movie was called Dark Water, the same as this episode. Now, much has been made of the history of the hotel also, the Cecil, as several of Los Angeles' notorious crimes have had a connection to this hotel. So we have lots to address today. It's a story with many, many facets and theories. But before we have our beer review, I just want to read a couple of our five-star reviews. So the first one is from Jewel Zed. And Jewel says... I just recently heard about the disappearance of Amy Bradley, and it's very intriguing. So I searched podcasts, and I found this one. I don't know what the reviewer who called it Nails on a Chalkboard is talking about. The hosts have made zero claims about being criminal profiling experts. That's true. Also, she said, would experts title their podcast True Crime Brewery? Question, question mark. The podcast is going over cases, and they talk about it honestly. And I wouldn't want to hear experts discussing cases, as I tend to tune that out. I don't know why, but that's just my experience. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you, Jewel SSD. We love your review. Made our day. The other one I'm going to read is from Troy the Trucker. And Troy the Trucker says, excellent true crime podcast. Great presentation. Fresh outlook on the true crime and mystery. Awesome beer introduction. That's me. Yep. I'm a former New Englander. And I can't wait to hear more. Troy the Trucker, Tucson, Arizona. So thanks, Troy, and thanks everyone who's listening today. Now let's go ahead and get our beer review with Dick before we discuss our case. I've got a really nice beer for today. This crime took place in California. And as anybody who drinks beer knows, there's a bunch of California breweries that produce outstanding beers. The beer I chose for today is called Bastard's Midnight Brunch brewed by Stone Brewing Company in Escondido, California. It's an American strong ale. This is a catch-all category for beers that are 7% alcohol by volume and above. Characteristics of the beers vary greatly, and a lot of times they're similar to barley wines and old ales. This particular one is their Double Bastard Ale, which is aged in bourbon barrels and maple syrup barrels. Now, a little backstory here. They produced a beer called Arrogant Bastard several years ago, which was a very hoppy, in-your-face beer. And it was known for its line, you're not worthy. So, you know, kind of like, you shouldn't be drinking this beer. You're you're too presumptuous. (laughs) So the Double Bastard is just an amped-up version of Arrogant Bastard. 
and this particular iteration is the double bastard with bourbon barrel and maple syrup barrel aging. It's a lot to go through. <laughs> so onto the beer. This one is a pretty ugly looking beer, gotta tell you. <laughs> it's kind of a muddy, murky brown color with no head to it. Just not a very attractive beer, but things get better, don't worry. So it's got a beautiful bourbon and maple syrup aroma with some coffee thrown in there. Taste is even better. There's bourbon, there's toffee, there's maple syrup, there's some coffee, and there's even some tobacco. It's a very smooth beer, kind of sweet, kind of sticky, lovely beer. Get some if you can. All right. And what are we drinking those out of? We're drinking these out of snifters because that's kind of my go-to glass anyway. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this is in a snifter. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dick. So how about if we scooch our stools and take our snifters to the quiet corner of the bar? Yes, where we can have a little discussion. And we can talk dark water. All right. All right. I'm ready. Elisa Lam, she was the daughter of immigrants from Hong Kong who own a restaurant in Burnaby, Canada. And she'd been a student at the University of British Columbia. In January of 2013, she didn't register for school, but instead she set off for a trip to Southern California. Now she called this trip her West Coast tour on her Tumblr blog. She planned to stop in San Diego, LA, Santa Cruz, and San Francisco. Yeah, and I'd like to know what launched her on this journey, but I don't think we know that, do we? But it's, it's yeah. just interesting to me in the uh, Asian population. I mean, Vancouver, which is where they live, or a suburb of Vancouver, has a huge Asian population, and they're pretty tight-knit. And this chi child, adult, actually, decides that I'm not going to enroll in school this semester, and I'm going to take a little trip. Yeah. It just seems a little strange. Well, I think she'd had a little trouble. You know, she was getting counseling and had some things going on. But she planned to stop there and have a good time. She, I thought it was kind of adventurous that she did it on her own. I might have been afraid to do that at the age of 21. Oh, for sure. It's a little, maybe a little risky. And I get the impression that she wasn't that well-traveled. Yeah, I don't know about that. She was using Amtrak and the city buses. She was traveling alone, as I said. And she had visited the San Diego Zoo, posting some photos there on her social media. And then when she checked into the Cecil Hotel near L.A.'s downtown Skid Row, she was initially assigned a shared room on the hotel's fifth floor, a hostel-type room. So she had roommates. Yep, she had roommates. Room, roommate or roommates, but not a single. No, and a day or two in, the roommates complained that Eliza had some odd behavior, and then Eliza was moved to a single room. And Elisa was moved to a single room. Do we know what this odd behavior was? Or just that she was weird enough that the roommate or roommates didn't want her in their room anymore? That's all we know. I haven't, I've looked, I have not been able to find any more details on that. I mean, if she was acting like she was acting in the elevator video, that might explain it. Yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get we? to that. Yep, yep, we will. So this brings up Elisa's mental state. Yes, I guess at some point fairly recently she'd been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was put on medication. Mm -hmm. So bipolar disorder is what used to be called manic depressive disorder and it's an alternating depression and mania or sometimes a rapid cycling of mood. Late adolescents, young adults tend to have episodes of depression alternating with euphoria grandiose thoughts, high activity levels, pressured speech, distractibility, hypersexuality, hyperreligiosity, mm. overspending, hallucinations, and delusions. Okay. Now, whoever she was seeing placed her on quite a cocktail of medications. She was on Welbutrin, Lamictal, Seroquel, and Effexor. Okay. Now, I'm familiar with Welbutrin and Effexor as antidepressants. Those are antidepressants. The what? Lamictal and the Seroquel are more for mood stabilization. Okay. So that you're neither manic nor depressed. 
Okay. But they don't do lithium anymore? Lithium is the gold standard, but it's kind of old. And uh, Lamictal has largely replaced it as the drug to use in bipolar disorder. Okay. Now, I also read she had no history of suicidal ideations, no suicide attempts that we know of. Right. Which is important because that's one of the theories, of course, of what happened to her. That is one of the theories. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we'll bring up, or I'll bring up later, is that she traveled with her medications, but they were in blister packs, which indicate to me that those were samples given to her by her physician or by the prescribing person. So would you like to discuss a little bit about the notoriety of the Cecil Hotel? Sure. Okay, so it was built in the 1920s, but it went downhill and never recovered as its downtown neighborhood decayed through the late 1900s, 1980s, 1990s. Lots of crime in that area. Yeah, it was right adjacent to the Skid Row district. And yeah. We know about Skid Row. <laughs> but the Cecil had grander plans to begin with. It was going to be a hotel for traveling businessmen and such that would be staying there for a couple of days, three days, and then leaving. Mm-hmm. But it got outshined by better hotels in the area. So it, it fell pretty quickly onto hard times. Yeah. And also some of L.A.'s notable murders had connections to this, as I think I mentioned in our introduction. Elizabeth Short, for example, the victim of the Black Dahlia murder in 1947, was reported to have spent some of her last days in the Cecil Hotel. Okay. Yep. Also, 1964, Goldie Osgood was raped and murdered in her room at the Cecil. Serial killers, Jack, is it Underweger? Unterweger. There, that sounds better. If we want to pronounce it in the German way. That sounds like the right way. Yeah. And Richard Ramirez, a.k.a. the Night Stalker. Yeah, he was creepy. Mm -hmm. And he stayed there. Yeah, they both resided at the hotel. That's a good advertisement for your hotel. And not did they just reside there. They resided there while they were actively committing murders. Yeah, so that's quite the place. Mm -hmm. Now there's also been an unusual number of suicides in the hotel. It wasn't from the roof that people had jumped, though, because there were four cases of people jumping from the hotel to commit suicide. And none of those had been on the roof, because I wondered about that. Access to the roof being too easy, maybe. Right, but at least in our case, you had to go through a door that was locked, and if you got through the door, an alarm would go off. Yeah, that's, so, what, that's what I heard. I don't know about those those cases. I mean, maybe they had tried to go up to the roof and couldn't, but mm-hmm. still, jumping from the 12th floor or 14th floor will probably kill you. Yeah, one lady, I forget what year this was, actually jumped and fell on a pedestrian and killed them both. Yeah. So that's <laughs> horrible. <laughs> What's how bad it's, could it's your luck so, be? <laughs> so gruesome, it's almost funny. <laughs> oh, God, Awful. I'm gonna jump out the window and kill myself. And oh, God, I fell on somebody and killed him too. Ah, <laughs> I don't know if you'd really be thinking that at the time, but <laughs> it, well, it probably all happened so fast. I would hope, yeah, I would hope so too. So, in recent years, the hotel's been rebranded as the Stay on Main. But everyone knows it's the Cecil, and there are even tours that go by, like horror tours, to look (laughs) at the Cecil. Sure. It's got its reputation. Yeah. So research from the U.S. sex offenders list also revealed that there were eight sex offenders living in the hotel during Elisa's stay there. Another glowing recommendation for the hotel. Yeah. I'm thinking her parents must not have been aware of the hotel. If they, you know, they're from Canada, maybe they had no idea. No, I mean, I I get the idea that she picked this hotel because she could get by cheaply. Yes. And she was rooming with uh, another person or persons, so the the daily rate couldn't have been too bad. Yeah, I suppose. But I wonder if maybe she was attracted to the mysteriousness of the whole thing as well. that could be too. You know how young folks are about that kind of stuff. Yeah, I I (laughs) guess. I, I don't know if she was aware of its reputation. Yeah, we don't know that. Now, while traveling on her West Coast tour, Elisa had been keeping in touch with her parents on a daily basis, but on January the 31st, the day that she was scheduled to check out of the Cecil and head to Santa Cruz, they didn't hear from her. So eventually they contacted the LAPD when they couldn't reach her and they flew out to help search for her. 
when questioned, the hotel staff who had seen Elisa said that they had only seen her alone. They hadn't seen her with anyone else. The only person who reported seeing and actually interacting with her outside of the hotel was Katie Orphan, the manager of a nearby bookstore. And she said that Elisa was friendly and acting kind of bubbly and normally, so maybe for her that was a little manic. But Katie Orphan didn't know Elisa, so she really didn't have anything to compare it to. But she didn't really find Elisa to be strange or sad or anything like that that she could tell. Yeah, so she she was there. She arrived the 26th mm-hmm. and was supposed to leave the 29th. So for those two or three days, other than the bookstore person, we don't know that she did much of anything. It sounds like she was pretty solitary and doing things on her own. Sounds like it. Now, police said they went ahead and searched the hotel to the extent that they legally were allowed. Now, this includes a search of Elisa's room and having the dogs go through all the public and business areas of the hotel, including the roof. The dogs were unsuccessful at finding Elisa's scent, so every guest room could not be searched because the police would need probable cause to believe a crime had been committed in a room in order to get a search warrant for a particular room. Sure. Yeah. They, they couldn't go through every room or any rooms other than Elisa's room. Yeah. That leaves a lot of possibilities open in my mind, though. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of rooms in that hotel. It was 14 stories high, something yeah. around there. And most of these people were long-term guests. A lot, a lot of people lived there, like, on a week-to-week basis. So it wasn't like a lot of wasn't like vacation land it was the kind of hotel you could get weekly rates on so people with criminal records people with not much money would just stay there on a weekly or monthly basis right so i mean in essence these were the homes of people Mm -hmm. some of these rooms yeah yeah so then the police don't have any reason to ask for a warrant to search those rooms right Now, it was a week after she went missing that the LAPD released the video of the last known sighting of her, and that was taken by video surveillance camera in one of the hotel elevators. Now, we're going to have a link to this video in our show notes because it's a very interesting video. Now, when I came to Dick and said I wanted to do this case, I said, I just can't watch that elevator video by myself. I get scared. It was it was just a very odd video. It's, it's disturbing. Pretty, pretty eerie. I, I don't know that it goes so far as to say disturbing, but it's it's definitely weird. Mm-hmm. There's uh, something going on in it. Yeah. You want to talk about what you saw? A little bit. Yeah, I think I might feel better if I can get some of that off my chest before bed tonight. Okay. Yeah. So the elevator footage has drawn a lot of interest due to her apparent strange behavior. And what she does is she gets on the elevator and she's pushing buttons, like a, like a string of buttons. Yeah. You know, kind of bent over, I looking mean, at it, them up close. She entered the elevator and she's staring at the bank of floors and pushes like four or five buttons. Yeah. I think before that she kind of hides in the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Pushes the buttons and then she does like a quick look out. She Both sides. She peeks, like peeks out. Peeking out. the door wasn't closing. She's looking around. Comes back in. Yeah. Goes back out. <laughs> and then she it almost looks like she's talking to somebody. Or she's gesticulating, moving her hands. I'd, You're kind yeah. of in a weird manner. I'd feel confident saying she was talking to somebody. I just don't know if she was hallucinating that somebody or if it was an actual somebody. But it definitely looked like she was talking to somebody. I would agree. Yeah. That she was talking to somebody. I think she was hallucinating. Maybe. But we'll, and maybe we'll it shouldn't be scary. I'm, when I think about why do I find this scary, mm-hmm. I think about it's probably some of the horror movies that I watched as when I was younger. Did you see The Grudge? No. Okay, The I, Grudge. I stayed away from horror movies. So these are Japanese horror movies. So she looks a lot of like the women that were in them. You know, she has the similar looks. Also, so there was The Grudge, which was really scary, and, oh gee, what else was there? I guess The Ring wasn't Japanese. Well, yeah, there was a Japanese version of The Ring, which was super duper scary. 
So it kind of reminds me of those. I don't know if it was Grudge 2 where you could just see the, they actually showed video footage of a apartment building or something. And you could see this petite Asian woman kind of coming and going. And we knew that she was not alive. She was a, I guess a ghost. Huh. Yeah. An evil entity. Yeah, I guess if you went into watching that video with some history. It's my baggage, yeah. Uh, you'd be more frightened by it. I think and so. I, I just looked at it and said, this is really weird. Yeah. She's, there's nobody else in the frame, frames, other than Elisa. Right. And it looked to me like she was conversing with somebody who wasn't there. So I'm figuring she's hallucinating. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's a two and a half minute clip. The camera at one of the elevator's cab rear corners is where it's coming from, and it's looking down from the ceiling, so it offers a view not just of its interior, but the hallway right outside the door. And it's also got that graininess, which gives me the frights. <laughs> and another thing is the timestamp is obscured. Well, it's not obscured. It's just kind of indecipherable. Yeah, but why? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it was consistently that way. Yeah. And I, I guess if you're into conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. you're thinking that somebody played with the tape. Sure. And that's how the uh, time and date stuff got obscured. Yeah. I would buy into that, probably. But maybe it was that way to begin with. And then at some points, it seems like her mouth is pixelized, so you can't see maybe if there's something you could read her lips saying, but it's been blurted out, like kind of smudged out, so you can't tell. All and, right. Yep. I don't think so, but... So she enters from the left, she goes to the control panel, she appears to select several floors, and then she steps back into the corner. After a few seconds, the door still doesn't close, which I'm thinking she's probably hit the button to keep the door open. Right. But, but she steps up to it, leans forward, so her head's through the door, looks in both directions, does that check. And then she steps back in, she backs up to the wall, and then into the corner near the control panel. And at some points she almost looks playful, and at other points she looks a little frightened. But through all this, the door remains open. Right. So... She walks over again to the doorway, leaning on the side, and this is when she steps out into the hall suddenly and then does that side step mm -hmm. back and forth and then steps back in. It's like the box step. When we learned to dance, we did that box step. Right. Yep. So she did a box step out, box step back, and then looked to her side, looked back out, stepped sideways again, and after a few seconds, she's mostly invisible behind the wall, and she has her back just to the outside of the elevator. The door remains open through it all, though. The whole time. Mm-hmm. You can see her right arm go up to her head at that point, and she turns to re-enter the elevator. Putting both hands on the side of the door as she does, she goes to the control panel again. Yeah. Seems to press random buttons again. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe because she didn't have her glasses on, she couldn't see. I don't know. But she pushes some buttons more than once, and then she returns against the wall again. She actually puts both hands over her ears and walks back to the section of the wall she'd been standing before, and still the door's open. So she turns to her right, begins rubbing her forearms together, waves her hands out to her sides with her palms flat, fingers outstretched, and this is where she's bowing forward slightly and rocking, and this can all be seen through the door because she's outside the door now, and this is where you think she's talking to someone, gesturing with someone. And then she backs to the wall again, and walks away to the left. Now when she walks away to the left, some of the videos I saw on YouTube, because there are several versions, which are all pretty much the same, but there's one where they really slow it down at the end, and when she turns her feet to walk away, it looks like there's a foot of someone else there that then turns, because it looks like you see her two feet turn to the left, and then there's this other foot still facing the other way that turns. So that kind of, well, when I was home alone, I'm going to be honest, it scared me. Yeah, I when I was looking at that part, it, it looked to me like it was her foot. And she was kind of pirouetting. And it didn't look like a big foot or anything. It looked like a fairly dainty foot. Well, you can only see the tip of it. I don't know how right. you could tell what size it was. Well, it wasn't a big foot. No, it wasn't big. I'm not saying it was big foot. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah. It wasn't, I'm not saying it was a large foot necessarily. But it could right. have been a ghost foot or foot of someone else. Oh, come on. 
Could have been. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Anyway. Well, just a little. I know we don't really want to get into it because neither of us believe in this paranormal ghost stuff. Knock on wood. <laughs> but there is a theory that um, there's a ghost in the hotel. And it refers back to the Cecil's dark past and how Elisa may have somehow became possessed or pursued by evil spirits. Yeah. Now, yeah. you got to give me a break on this. I mean, this, yeah. this is just utter bullshit. Okay. There isn't any such thing as ghosts. Well, even some fairly sensible people think that a building can have a bad energy from things that have happened in it. Do you, have, do you give any kind of credit to that at all? None whatsoever. Okay, so you're a complete I mean, it's, skeptic. It's all in the minds of the people looking at the building. It's, it just doesn't exist. It's not true. You can color me as a complete skeptic on that. So would you go spend the night there alone? Sure. With no power? Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't. Well, I, it's no worse than any other place okay. in, in terms of spirits. I mean, mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't work. Right. So people have this theory. I guess what I would say about it is there are no facts to back it up. There's nothing to prove that that is something. So I think we can dismiss it, even though part of me says, ooh, but I think we can logically dismiss that theory. Well, we can logically dismiss it because it doesn't exist. It's a fiction. Okay. So you can, you can say, oh, yeah, she was possessed or there were demons or ghosts or something. It's just utter crock. Well, I hope so, because in The Grudge, she was very evil and possessed and came after people because her husband had killed her and this other guy had treated her badly. And so right. I'll remind you, though, that The Grudge was a movie. <laughs> okay. 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 So let's go to theory number two. Let's. A let's, resident... let's please move on from the <laughs> paranormal ghost theory. Okay. It just makes me nuts. I know. Okay. A resident or a staff member was pursuing her and took advantage of her, and she ended up getting assaulted and murdered. Okay. Okay. We have any evidence that she was followed or watched by one of the staff? Okay. Well, let's go over why this might be true. Sure. The video is said to have been tampered with, that there was a, a minute of it missing before it was made public by the FBI. I don't okay. have proof that it was or wasn't. So who says there's missing a missing minute? Many people. Many people. Many people. Such as? Such as people on Reddit. Okay. <laughs> people well, on YouTube. Yeah, I listen to them all the time. So there's no proof of that, but it, mean, is, they, it they, is a conjecture that that could have happened. The FBI and the LAPD who have looked at the video, no, none of them have said this video is clearly altered. No, this is how they released it. The, the copy that we looked at is how it was released from the FBI. What people say is that the FBI didn't release the whole thing or, or changed it a little bit. The FBI will neither confirm nor deny that. Because it's a bullshit accusation. Okay, but the FBI didn't say no, we didn't take any parts out of this. This was not tampered with. They never <laughs> said that either. Well, okay. how do you answer a negative with a negative or whatever? I mean, it's just... <laughs> how do you prove a negative? Right. Right. Well, this is just one of the things that would go into this idea of a so, homicide. So the idea is that the video was altered because there was a person in the video. That. Yeah, and it could have been something totally legitimate, like maybe an innocent person was there and the FBI didn't want to release them, their picture, to the public. That would be totally right. acceptable. At the same time, I would figure if they have this crime and they have evidence that something happened at the hands of another person, that they'd show the video and hope that somebody could identify the person. Well, absolutely, but they didn't have any of that proof. They haven't because it doesn't exist. It's possible, though. Um, another reason I would think that it could have been that is because she may have not been alone. The way she came out and was gesturing, maybe um, maybe there was a guy out there holding the button of the elevator in the hallway to keep it open and not let her go. Well, she had been out of the elevator enough times to see if there's anybody out there mm -hmm. holding the door open. Right. And there 
wasn't anybody. Well, how do we know there wasn't anybody? Because she was talking to somebody out there. If she wasn't hallucinating, who was she talking to? Well, she was hallucinating. She was. If she was talking to somebody, mm -hmm. she would have run or done something to evade the person that she was talking to. Well, she may not have known that it was a bad person. <laughs> she may have just been followed oh. by someone. All right. That's, okay. Again, that's straining the boundaries of my belief. Okay. That, well, here's something that someone proposed on Reddit that... Elisa may have been stalked by two men and decided to confront them, assuming they were playing some court, sort of um, cat and mouse flirtation with her. So she enters the elevator with an attitude, and this is when she's kind of playful, and she's pressing multiple buttons and door hold to hold it on the 14th floor and deter it from being called till the stalkers arrived. And then initially bobbing her head out when she does the quick back and forth, to embarrass them, she looks out again, and they're still hanging out there. So she steps out of the elevator to confront them. This is where she gestures to the left, pointing out that they don't follow her to the area covered by the camera, and they say, well, we're not stalking you, or deny that they're after her. And then she raises her hands in frustration, gesturing, re-enters the elevator, presses more buttons to keep the elevator on hold, then, this is crazy, they have not entered the elevator. Why are they not coming near the videotaped area? The idea that this person, Sarah, has is that they did not come to the videotaped area because they had bad intentions towards Elisa and they knew about the security tape. So they'd either been living there a long time or they worked there. Or she was hallucinating and imagining all this. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just strains the bounds of what you think's going on. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very detailed explanation for something that likely never happened. Right. Is there any real evidence that she had mental disorders? Has anyone actually seen the doctor's reports? I read a rather interesting theory that she accidentally pressed the button for the 14th floor instead of the 4th because the numbers look similar and she didn't have her glasses on. So she walks out goes to her room, and being unable to lock it because it's the wrong room, she alerts the resident in it. And then she finds out that was a mistake, and then she sees something in the room when he opens the door that freaks her out, and she goes back to the other elevator that she's recorded in. And then he goes after her and kills her because she witnessed something. Wow. These are all that's, possibilities. That's, well, sure. <laughs> And it's possible that she is abducted by Martians. Let's look at what's probable. Okay. Possibilities exist in numerous fashion. But what are, what are the probabilities? Hmm. Right? Well. So. Okay. One, one is that somebody killed her. Yes. And that's not like Martians because people do no, kill other people. Absolutely. To be fair. No, I'm not saying that. Okay. But, but I'm going to eliminate all this stuff about how she went to the wrong room and saw something in the room that she shouldn't have, or two guys were following her and did her in. But I think the simple fact is that, yeah, she could have met up with the wrong person. There were eight sex offenders in that hotel alone. Who killed her. And they could have, yes. And there's another possibility. What's that? That she had a mental illness. Mm -hmm. And... She was hallucinating and somehow found herself up on the roof and decided to go swim. Well, okay. I shouldn't say it exactly that way. But I think that her mental illness was the factor in her death. Well, I think her mental illness could have been a factor in her death, even if it was a homicide, because I think it made her vulnerable. Okay. Okay. But I think to get further on this and some of my other points, we need to go ahead to where the body was found and exactly what would be involved for her to end up in that tank and to independently end up in that tank as opposed to be put in the tank. Okay. Okay. So while the search was going on for her before they'd found her, the guests of the hotel began complaining about low water pressure. Some of them said the water was oddly colored. Some said it had a sweet, unusual smell and taste. And some people complained that it, when it first turned on the water, it was dark. So the management investigated 
And on February 19th, which is like three weeks after she disappeared, an employee went to the roof where they had four 1,000-gallon water tanks that provided water from the city's supply. And I think that went mm -hmm. to people's um, sinks, showers, yeah. their room water. So in one of the tanks, this poor employee found Elisa's body floating face up, a foot below the water's surface. Now police were called, so they had to drain the tank so firefighters could cut the tank open and remove her body since the opening on the top of the tank would be too small to accommodate their equipment that would be necessary to get her out of there. So at this point, short-term guests left. The hotel paid for some people to relocate, and the health department did test the water and found that it wasn't contaminated, but they did issue a do-not-drink order. And the, <laughs> I can imagine. And the entire water system was drained, cleaned with chlorine, and then refilled with water. Yeah. So it was sanitized before people were but, I mean, expected a, to drink it. A corpse floating in the water. Yeah. So, yeah, don't drink that water. Right. Now, I know you read the autopsy, and there wasn't a lot to it, but tell us what you found. Well, this, this woman had been in water for about three weeks. Yeah. So she was bloated. She was discolored. Uh, she was a mess. And... They said that they couldn't find any evidence for cause of death, so they decided it was accidental drowning, with her bipolar disorder being a significant factor contributing to that. Mm -hmm. There was some rape kit testing and fingernail testing. Nothing was found there. Blood work didn't show anything. They did find some metabolites of her prescription medications, but nothing else really. So it was a pretty non-committal autopsy. Mm -hmm. So when a body decomposes in water like that, explain to us how the body responds to that as far as fluids, as far as medication levels. How is that affected by being in water like that? Well, you're, you're in water, so you're going to absorb the water through the skin. Okay. Um, and if, if you were alive when you went into the water, you'll have some in your lungs. Right. All that fluid is going to dilute out what's going on in your body. Well, that's why I wonder, is there a way that they can calculate from how much water she was in, how diluted the properties would be when they test for drugs and things like that? Oh, possibly, but they don't have anything. No. I mean, other than her drugs that she was taking. Right. Allegedly. Yep. Now, I, some people had said her clothes were missing, but from most of the research that I would believe, her clothes were in the tank but removed from her body. And I know we'll talk about this later on, but if, if you're killing this woman and throwing her in the tank, why do you take the clothes off of her and throw them in the tank too? To that, I would say maybe she was naked. Maybe she'd been raped. To begin with. To begin with. And then so, they just threw the clothes in after her. Okay. Or before her. And she was face up. According to most accounts, there were a few accounts that didn't say that, but I went with the most believable and the, as far as quantity and quality yeah. of reports, I tried to go with the most likely. So it would seem to me that if somebody had raped or harmed her and killed her, and tossed her in the tank, she'd be face down. Hmm. I don't know. The tank is like four feet wide by eight feet high. Yeah, but they're, they're, someone's putting her through a narrow opening. Okay. So she's going to go in head first. Well, maybe not. Maybe feet first. No, because then things get in the way. If you put her in feet first, uh -huh. her arms could be spread out. Well, you could lift her arms straight up over her head, too. Yeah. The easiest way is to dump her in head first. <laughs> if, okay. If you're... So inclined? So inclined. If you've killed her and, and you're trying to dispose of the body, mm -hmm. it's head first. Well, as you said, the coroner did say that her death was found to be an accidental drowning, but then they actually switched it to undetermined at a later point. Now, toxicology well, tests... but she still drowned. 
Yes, they, she did drown. We just don't know if it was accidental right. or why. So it's it's not indeterminate. She drowned. Whether, there was water in her lungs. Whether she went in on her own power or someone put her in, which is the indeterminate part, mm -hmm. um, she still drowned. Now, if she was awake when they put her in and she wasn't dead or unconscious, you still think it would be, I think it'd be easier to put her in feet first if she was squirming and fighting. No, you'd still put her in head first. Really? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's hard to turn someone upside down. Well, you're up on this ladder on the top of the tank. Yeah. You'd have to and carry her up that ladder. Open right. the latch. You're, you're damaging your own case here. Well, no, I don't have a case. I'm I mean, open. If, if you're thinking that somebody harmed her. I'm thinking maybe two guys. Okay. So they have to carry her up the ladder and dump her in the tank. Right. And they're going to carry her up uh, and dump her head first. That's just the natural way to do it. Okay. I don't know how you reach that conclusion, but I'm going to just say okay. I don't know why you think that. Well, that's just how it would happen. Okay. Okay, well, I'd be Maybe interested to know any if evidence. any other ways like that, if that's what they did, if there were any other similar crimes, if people were put in head first. But even if she was put in head first, she could flip over. I mean, I really don't think that has any, I don't think being face up means anything. That's just, can you agree with me on that? Her no. position in the tank is irrelevant. No, it's not. Okay. I'll tell you why. Tell me or why. Or do you want me to tell you now or later? Tell me now. I'll tell you now because she went in the tank voluntarily. She was delusional and hallucinating. And she went in the tank and she was floating in it. So she was face up. So uh, See, I've convinced you, huh? <laughs> so what about the rape and finger fingernail kit? What about being in the water? Wouldn't that... I dilute some DNA and I don't things. know that that would help at all. So the fact that the rape kit and the fingernail kit were inconclusive or negative to me doesn't mean a thing. Because of because being in the water. Because she been in the water for that length of time. I agree with you on that, totally. Yep. So you said there were metabolites and traces of her prescription medication. Also, there was her watch and her room key. Right. Of, of note is that they never found her phone. But I guess... She had been. She had borrowed a friend's phone that she'd been communicating with her parents with. So I don't know whatever happened to it, but it was not found on her or in her room. Nobody's ever found the phone. Not that I know of, no. Okay. So the investigation determined how she died, but it really didn't offer an explanation as to how she got into the tank, right? Right. The doors and stairs that access the hotel's roof, as you said, they're locked. And only staff have passcodes and keys. Right. So any attempt to force them would supposedly have triggered the alarm. Yeah, even even if you could circumvent the lock, the alarm still should have sounded. Right. But there's fire escapes. Yeah, the fire escapes could have allowed her to bypass these security measures. Um, yeah, if she had known about that. Well, she didn't even have to know about that. She goes to the door, it's locked, and she's looking for other ways to get up there. And yeah. she chooses a fire escape. Well, I think you'd have to go through a room and out a window. Well, not necessarily. No? There might be windows outside of rooms where you could access the fire escape. Okay. So you think she would have done that? Why? Out of confusion? Yeah. Okay. I think, well, I'm giving my bias away. You've given but, your bias away a long time ago, so oh, don't worry so about I that. We know we know what you think. I can go for it. Now. Yes, please. I think she had an idea that she wanted to get to the roof. She needed to get to the roof. And she tried the door and couldn't get through the door. So she found the fire escape and took that route. So apart from the question of how she got on the roof then, how did she get into the tank by herself? Now, all four tanks are, like I said, four by eight. They're cylinders. They're propped up on concrete blocks. There's no fixed access to them, and hotel workers had to use a ladder to look into the water. 
They're also protected by heavy lids of 20 to 25 pounds that would be difficult to pull back down from within, especially if you are in there. She's shorter than the depth of the water, so she has nothing to push with her feet to reach up and grab the lid mm -hmm. and pull it down, right? If you're treading water, how do you reach up and pull that lid down? Well, let's see. Maybe she had it in her hand and she went in and pulled the lid as she went into the water because mm -hmm. she couldn't reach it when she's in the water. I don't know about that. It looks like when you open it, it, it doesn't have degrees of opening where you can just hold on to it. It's no. either flipped all the way it, open or flipped op shut. Open or shut. It's one of those heavy metal things. So that's hard to explain. I think you'll admit that. I'll admit that, but okay. I, I think she could do it. Okay. So police dogs that searched through the hotel for her, and they searched even on the roof shortly after her disappearance, didn't find any trace of her. So if she'd gone up there on her own, you think they would have been able to follow her scent. One would think. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess that goes better with your theory that somebody had killed her and carried her up there. Right. Yeah. I could see that because I could see if two people had taken advantage of her and then wanted to get rid of her, especially if someone worked for the hotel or they'd been there a long time and they knew the place pretty well, then that would be a place to take her where she wouldn't be found for a long time, which is what happened. Well, I would think they wouldn't even have to put her in a water tank. They could just put her on the roof someplace, because who goes up on the roof routinely? I don't know. Nobody. Right, but the so, water tank would cause her to decompose quicker, and it would also destroy the rape evidence, as we discussed. Ah. Uh, uh-huh. Okay. Okay. So... The, the killers are smart enough to figure we better dump her in the water because that'll obscure evidence. Mm-hmm. Nah, I don't buy that either. No. Okay. Well, even the pathologists appeared to be a little bit ambivalent about their conclusion that her death was accidental, though, because one page of the report has a form with boxes to check. Well, you know, you've read it, but just so people know, the form has boxes to check as to whether the death was accidental, natural, homicide, suicide, or undetermined. Now, in large type, in a sufficient distance from these, the accident box was dated on June 15th. However, three days later, the undetermined box was checked instead of that. So there was some point in these three days before the report was released that this was noted as an error, crossed out, and initialed. So that's interesting. But not really. I no. mean, Explain that to me, I mean, for me. They initially said it was an accident. Right. And then they're not certain. So they're leaving other possibilities open. So they say indeterminate. Okay. I mean, that's that's all that means to me. Okay. I mean, it's not saying, oh, because if, if they were convinced it was a homicide, they would have labeled it differently. Yes, if they were convinced. But I think they're leaving it open to the fact that it could be. Okay. And we have no evidence that she was suicidal. Are you saying, you're not saying she did it as a suicide. You're saying she just did oh. it because she was hallucinating. Yes. And what would cause the hallucinations? Her, she was in a manic phase of her bipolar disorder. And what and, about the medications? Well, I'm going back to the medications. They found blister packs of medications, which to me indicates that she had been given samples. Mm -hmm. So she hadn't been on them very long. This, this is the type of thing you pass out samples and say, let's see how this does. Uh, and give me a call in a week or two and we'll see how, it's, how they're working. Mm -hmm. And I might change them. So she, she hadn't been given a prescription that she took to a pharmacy and had that filled. She had samples. Right, but are you going to start someone on four different medications at once? That doesn't make sense either. Wouldn't you have her try one medication or two medications at a time? Well, I'm not going to address that You're going to throw part. four at her, are you? I'm not a psychiatrist, so maybe that cocktail was something that the person prescribing him felt would be most effective for her. Well, I don't think that's a legitimate way to do it, because if you do that, you don't know what drug is working, what drug isn't working, what drug's causing side effects. I think well, when you start someone on something like that, you start with one or two medications. 
that's how I would do it. Okay. But I don't know what the thinking of the prescribing physician was. So maybe that's something that they used frequently and mm-hmm. said, okay, this, this is going to help your bipolar disorder. So I'm putting you on these four meds. I can't tell you. I think if that was the case I, and I was her mother, I would sue him because I would hold him responsible. If you're saying that this girl had an, an horrible episode that caused her death, and two or three weeks earlier, she was giving four medications to start, like randomly, just like hunky dunky. There you go. I don't think so. I would have a problem with that. I think well, that would be malpractice. Yeah. Again, we're not psychiatrists, and and we don't prescribe these medicines. No. I mean, one of the side effects of Wellbutrin is anxiety and central nervous system stimulation. One of the side effects of the lamictal that she's taking is a taxi where you can act like you're drunk and out of it. So, I mean, it could be a med effect. I don't know. Well, I believe uh, Wellbutrin and effects are work in a very similar way. I, I haven't known many people that are on both at the same time. It's one or the other, which I'm not saying that it would be wrong necessarily to be on two, but to start two at the same time. To me, that doesn't seem like the right way to handle yeah, things. It doesn't to me either, but again, I'm not a psychiatrist, and maybe that's a cocktail that they use. I, I don't know. Okay. Well, if any of our listeners are psychiatrists or psychiatric yeah. nurse practitioners, we'd love to hear what you think about that. Yes. Because I have so, a problem with that. So, again, she was on Wellbutrin, Lamictal, Seroquel, and Effexor. Now, Seroquel, I think some people take it to sleep at night, so I can kind of see that if you're taking Wellbutrin or Effexor, you can have a hard time sleeping. And then you might take the Seroquel at bedtime. I've heard of that. Possibly. Yeah. But it's also a mood-stabilizing drug. Right. So she was on kind of like two antidepressants and two mood-stabilizers. Yeah, that's a lot of drugs. So, again, I don't know psychiatry well enough to say that wasn't the right mix of drugs, but it's it's a lot of medication. Yeah. But it, to me, if, if they found blister packs in her room, it indicates that these were samples and she had just been started on them. Right. So either, going back to my theory. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Is that she hadn't gotten a therapeutic response to the meds and she entered a manic phase and was hallucinating and that's how she ended up finding herself in the water tank. Okay. Speaking of litigation, there is some interesting litigation I read about. So a week after... They they didn't sue the psychiatrist, right? That we know of. Mm, I don't think that... No. That's what I would have done. But a (laughs) week after her body was found, a couple who was staying at the Cecil filed a lawsuit against the hotel. Now, this was because they said the hotel was in breach of contract with the guests since it was assumed that it would provide water pure enough to drink and bathe with. Instead, they argued in the complaint filed in the L.A. County Superior Court, the defendants provided water that had been contaminated by human remains. And but the hotel didn't know that there was a dead body floating in one of their tanks. How, how are you going to blame the hotel? Well, they sought a, ref- they sought a refund of the $150 um, hotel fee. Yeah, that they'd pay for the two-night stay was $150, yes, plus $100 in medical expenses and other relief, which that seems like and, a bargain, actually. And the hotel probably paid those. Uh, or they probably... Well, it was a class action with other people. They probably refunded the money that people had spent for their rooms. Well, they said they put some people up in other hotels, so I think yeah. they did try and make so, it up to them. So they are trying to make it right. Right. I'm sure they were quite embarrassed at a body being found in their water supply. Oh, gosh. And then that September, Elisa's parents filed a wrongful death suit against the hotel in the Superior Court. Now, they claim the hotel failed to inspect and seek out hazards in the hotel that presented an unreasonable risk or danger to Elisa and to the other hotel guests. Now, they sought unspecified damages and their daughter's burial costs as well. So that sounds to me like they weren't saying that there was homicide involved. They were just saying that the hotel failed to prevent their daughter from getting up on the roof Mm -hmm. and diving into the water tank. Right. (laughs) Now with the... So they didn't, I don't see 
looking at that, I don't see any claim that the hotel uh, was responsible in the terms and sense of somebody in the hotel doing harm to Elisa. Right. That's not what they were suing well, for. Well, this is what the parents were saying, yeah. But the parents okay. aren't always right. Okay. So with this case, there you're, were... You're clinging to that thought. Well, I think it's possible, yeah. After two years of depositions from the hotel's employees and investigators, the Lambs moved for a summary judgment in their favor while the hotel sought to have the lawsuit dismissed, of course. Now, its employees had testified that they did not hear the roof alarm go off during Elisa's stay, nor were they aware of any other attempts to access the roof without authorization, other than hers during the tenure at the Cecil. So the whole time, I guess no one else had gotten up there that they knew of. And the hotel's attorney argued the hotel could not have reasonably foreseen that Elisa might have entered the tank. That's what you said, right? That's right. Yep. And he also reiterated that it was still unknown how she got into the water tank. Yes. Right? So no liability could be assigned for failing to prevent that. So what happened to the suit? So um, it was in late 2015 that the suit was dismissed, agreeing with the hotel's arguments, the very nature of the water tank would make it unreasonable for Elisa to assume that she was allowed to climb in and open the lid. Thank you. Now, David Johnston, the Lamb's attorney, he remained unconvinced, of course, noting that the hotel had since secured the tank entrance with a lock and installed hinges. So, you know, this was an accident waiting to happen, according to him, although... I don't know how you could accidentally get yourself shut in that tank. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And I can see after the fact they're, they're going to say, well, we'll make sure that nobody else ever can get access to the tank, so here's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. But that's after the fact. Right. And I don't know if they did fingerprints or anything of the tanks to see if any of the residents had touched the tanks. That would have been something to do. Yeah. So I don't know. I, guess. I haven't read anything about that in all my um, internet I'm, travels. I haven't seen anything about I'm that. I'm figuring it was investigated pretty well. I would imagine. So another interesting thing is the film and television aspect. The circumstances of her death have been compared, as I said, to plot elements in the 2005 horror film Dark Water. Now, Saturday, I think it was, I made an effort and I watched it. Painful to watch, not a good movie. You watched Dark Quarter? I did. Why? It was on Amazon. Just to see, you know, I thought, well, I'm doing this. I should have, they're comparing it to that. I should see what I think. I vaguely remember that movie. It's a really shitty movie. Yeah, it was very shitty, and it came out years before. So that's the weird thing, is it came out before this happened. Yeah, so they weren't copying anything. Nope. So maybe Elisa was copying the movie. Well, that would be weird, but maybe. Yeah. Because in the movie, it was, a ho it was an apartment building. It wasn't a hotel. And it was a small girl that had been put in there through a homicide. So if we want to compare it to that, it was probably a homicide. Yeah, but she got the idea. Okay. Or possibly. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm wandering far you afield are, now. You so are. So ignore me. <laughs> hey, enough said. Okay. See? <laughs> That's not hard. No. Okay, so Dark Water. And that was actually a remake of a Japanese film. So, good thing I didn't watch the Japanese one. I'd be really scared. So, a dysfunctional elevator and discolored water were gushing from the faucets, and it was much more dramatic than the real-life story. I don't think that we know exactly what happened to her. I think that between the two, as a, two of us, we have two reasonable possibilities, which would be homicide or accidental death due to her mental illness. Right. Okay. But I think that's where everybody is because mm -hmm. we're going to eliminate the paranormal we can safely it, dismiss the ghost it, possession it just theories didn't happen right well so, there's no scientific or factual information that support anything like that right <laughs> right but it doesn't makes have for to good be. It, makes for good horror it, movies and yes yes so yeah i mean either she was killed and put in there or she somehow found herself in there because of her mental state mm-hmm so the video seems that someone could have been in the hallway, and that's what makes me think it could be homicide, even though there were no signs and symptoms of a struggle on her body. But as I said, I think being in that water really would have a negative effect on any kind of evidence of her being harmed prior to her death. Yeah, no, I, I don't, unless it was real obvious stuff. In fact, she'd been floating for three weeks. 
would mean that most superficial marks wouldn't be there. Right. So it, it's kind of a sensation on the internet, all the information, and that does make me feel bad for the family. So I wish that they could find out what happened. And maybe someday they will. They might, they might. although it doesn't look likely. Not at this point. Unless somebody confesses or they can find somebody. You never know. You never know. But otherwise, you're going to be saying, what do we think happened? Just <laughs> like us. <laughs> right. And, and this is what I think, and that's what you think. Right. We can put our ideas out there, and that's all we can do at this point. Yeah. So as I said in our show notes, there's going to be a link to the YouTube elevator video of Elisa Lamb. Also, we'd like you to visit our website, www.tigrabber.com, to learn more about True Crime Brewery. Episodes are available on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play. You can also follow us on Twitter at TigrabberPods. To support the podcast and boost our craft beer fund, subscribe to us on our website, and you can do that for as little as a dollar a month using PayPal. Yes, because then we'll have really good beers. And if you buy me beer, I'll name you in the beer (laughs) review. Okay. You can also recommend a beer or a case if you'd like to. And if you do that, I'll put you in the beer review. (laughs) I'm pretty easy, so just, just... Give me some money or some (laughs) tips for beers, and you'll get your name in. Okay. Now, we're also on Patreon, in case that doesn't work out. And there you can contribute money on a per-podcast or monthly basis to try and support the uh, podcast. So another absolutely free way to help us is to leave us a five-star review on iTunes. And we have gotten a few of those, so that made us very happy. Even the ones with fewer stars we like to read, but... We're only going to share the ones with five stars, because that's what we said in the first place. It is. Plus, who wants to talk about the one-star reviews? I know. Well, there were only one or two one-star ones, and one of them was because of our audio quality, which I totally understand, because, you know, we're new at this. We've definitely made progress. Yeah. The first couple make me cringe a little. Yeah. But that's the way it works when you do something new. And even, even the less than glowing reviews give us an opportunity to learn about what we're doing wrong. That's so, right. And what on. we're doing right. Right. So if you'd like to suggest a true crime or a beer for our show, you can also email it to us at truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com. Or we love it when people leave voicemails because then we can play them on the um, episode. You can go to our website. There's a little link on the right side. Send a voicemail and you can just tell us whatever you think. Sounds good. Okay. So that's it for today. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Next time.